Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast. Hey, it's another year, another time to make some more money, and I've got the course for you. Uh, start the conversation, get the meeting, will help your team both business development, sales development, get into those new cold accounts, whether that function is under marketing or sales, I'll help you with that. By starting organic, natural conversations, not pitching, have people open up with you, build up a connection with them, understand your total addressable market, prioritize it, and put in a system that scales, that's predictable, that works the way you want it to work instead of the old school pitch. Believe me, I've sat through so many of these (laughs) cold calling seminars courses, books, and I've been doing it for 30 years, and it's evolved, and what I'm doing today is what's working in today's world. It works naturally, and people are just loving it, getting meetings, closing deals, and doing it without the rejection that is typically there in sales. So check it out at b2brevenue.com under the training tab. You can schedule a call with me. We can talk it over. I'll explain how it works and how we can work together on it. You can buy it per student or I'll customize it for your particular product and team and coach you through that process. Also, if you're a sales leader and you want predictability, you want direction, momentum, and control with your deals, you can sign up for that course as well. Same type of model, a year-long access to it. It's content, community, and coaching all included at b2brevenue.com. You can get my free ebook there on how companies make product selections. That's all free. Let's get into the interview, but I want to make sure you're checking out my partners. They're in the show notes. Uh, this week, it's PipeDrive and CoVideo. PipeDrive is the new CRM. It's, well, new. It's been out for five years. I've been using it forever. I love that. It's connected up with your email, your calendar, and now they have team capabilities CoVideo is the video email system. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's the way to break into new accounts. It's so much more engaging than text. Check them out. Also, make sure you're checking me out on LinkedIn, Brian G. Burns on LinkedIn. Let's get into the interview. I'll sum it up at the end. Hey, Millie, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us about yourself. Thank you, Brian. Uh, my name is Millie Blackwell. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Showcase and a co-founder of Showcase Workshop. Uh, Showcase is a sales content management app and in short, it replaces ring binders and most printed sales materials for field field sales teams. Um, I am originally from New Zealand and for the past four years, I have been based in California. Uh, How'd you end up there? Uh, and some initial members of our US, US-based team were based there, so it just made sense for me to end up there. And um, I was lucky enough to sort it out so that I could live in the Napa Valley and commute. So pretty hard to give that up, you know, yeah. hard to find a better alternative than the Napa Valley. Oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm very, very lucky. And how did you get into this line of business? Yeah, so... Uh, I my background is in adver- advertising, and I had worked in agencies before starting Showcase. And uh, I guess a lot of the projects that I worked on were things that I would say um, would be considered internal communications. So that the last agency that I was with had uh, had a lot of accounts with um, oil companies, and BP was one of their big accounts. And the pro- I was working on a lot of projects where information was going from head office out to BP sites and out to their commercial sales teams. And this, this at this point, this was 2010, and iPads were just a brand new gadget in 2010, which when you say it, it seems kind of recent history, but that's when they came around. And it struck me that BP, especially in, in their contemporaries, were printing and physically distributing a lot of materials out to their sites. And, you know, here in, here in the U.S., that's thousands of sites. And in most other countries, that's hundreds of sites. And those documents are several hundred pages at a time. So there's the logistics of that, there's the cost of that, and then there's the environmental impact of that. And it struck me straight away that wouldn't it be great to replace all of that with an iPad, send an iPad to the sites and start sending materials out to them. 
And um, so Showcase came about actually from, I guess, from a rejection. So I had pitched this idea on myself and my boss at the time, had pitched this idea to BP. And back then, um, uh, gas sites or fuel stations still didn't allow you to use your mobile phone on the forecourt or when you were putting gas in the car. So they had an instinctive reaction, which was, well, we probably can't have an iPad in the sites either. And, but they, but they said, well, this could be a good idea for sending information out to our commercial sales team. So while it was, we were initially rejected on the original idea, um, they, the client found the workaround and that's how showcase came around. Well, it certainly is a good idea. You're talking to somebody who used to, you know, fill up, um, you know, the briefcase with brochures and (laughs) drag them onto an airplane and, (laughs) Sometimes I joke that we're saving salespeople's backs from just lugging around yeah. paper <laughs> folders. Yeah. And, and yeah. That's, that's it. And I remember the iPad. I, I was at the Apple store the night it came out. And I was like, when I first saw the iPhone, I was like, why can't they just make this bigger? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the Apple owes you a commission. Maybe you had the idea first. <laughs> so you've had to do a lot of selling in your career, huh? Yeah, and um, and not I was not a salesperson to start with, and selling there were four co- four co-founders of Showcase, um, two more on the marketing side and two technical founders, and selling ended up falling to me, I guess, because I had the least specific skill area in any other part of the business. Um, so we started the business with a little bit of naivety that we could build it and we would just have a flood of customers because it was such a good idea. But then when we realized that that wasn't going to be true, one of us had to go out and sell and and that person ended up being me. So I, um, I guess you'd say that I started selling with a lot of uninformed optimism about how it would work. And um, at that time we were just selling in New Zealand and New Zealand is – still quite an open market and still uh, marketing managers for the most part or senior people inside of organizations, you can still actually call them and have a good chance getting them on the phone when you call. Um, So yeah, I just started calling around. I started with um, Hyundai, a brand called Z, which is, uh, or Z, which is um, the retail brand of what was Shell Oil. Uh, I just started with companies like that. I thought this would suit them. I just started calling around. I got some meetings, and that's how we got our first our first clients. So partly from my naivety, um, and obviously partly because it was a great solution for them. Yeah, and I, I bet you learned a lot through that process, huh? Oh yeah, and <laughs> I just, <laughs> I um I just kind of took to it. I found that the I loved the energy of not knowing what would happen when I got to the meeting, of just um, getting there and I loved learning about all these organizations because really I just really did not know that much about how enterprises or large companies worked and so um, I just had a natural enthusiasm for learning that and then seeing if there was a space that showcase could fit into um, and then over time people have suggested lots of books to me and courses and so I started to get a more polished approach to the sales process. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about that. I mean, how is it different today than it was when you first started? What were your kind of key lessons? So I think that the in the early days, I was just cold calling, going to meetings, um, and trying to turn sales over that way. And now we have, um, I guess, a more sophisticated marketing program, and we have leads coming in that sales team are then actioning and turning into customers. Um, But I think the big change has probably been for us more on what, on the value proposition and what we are selling. So in the early days, I could, I was sort of basically calling up with this idea of, hey, we've got this app and it's for the sales team. Would you want to have a look at it? Um, But now a lot of the things that were valuable about that, the fact that um, it worked off of line and you could just send things out to the iPads. A lot of that has sort of become less value or more commoditized. There's lots of ways that the companies can solve that problem. So we've really had to look more to niching down into specific industries where the field sales team has a really specific kind of requirement um, whether you know selling moderately or highly complex product rather than just um, I guess 
uh, I guess, less compre- p- complex product. So, yeah, it's really been our value proposition that has changed over time and um, not so much uh, in this market in the US, not so much cold calling and expecting to get anybody on the phone. And so what does your sales process look like today? Who do you call on? Who's your point of entry? What do they care about? Sure, yeah. So our our customer is almost always marketing in the marketing team, so a marketing director or VP of marketing. And for them, the challenge that Showcase can solve is that, you know, when you're when you're running the marketing department, your challenge is, and you have a field, you're running a marketing department and you have a field sales team, your challenge is how do I keep all of those, or how do I keep that whole team on brand and on message and singing from the same playbook? How do I ensure that they, when a message is changed or for most of our customers, when a price sheet or a spe- specifications document changes, how do I ensure that they have all got the up-to-date version and they're not using a version that they saved on their desktop two years ago? Um, and how do I how do I make how do I have the most chance of my sales team looking the most professional and the most successful in front of customers? So uh, across our customer base, they have a field sales team who are selling face-to-face with a customer. So they want to give their sales team that chance of success and showcase looks like in the field, it looks like a beautiful sales presentation um, and it gives the sales team access to all of that supporting collateral that they would have otherwise had as a paper brochure or a PowerPoint saved onto their desktop. And uh, I guess, I mean, I know selling marketing is a tough situation. They're very busy. Uh, They've got a ton of technology uh, to look at. Um, Their their budgets for internal stuff is kind of tight because they're spending, trying to spend all their money on promotion of their product. Mm. How, how do you work around that? So I guess there's, I guess there's a few questions there. I'll try to remember each one. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, they they are busy. I mean, who isn't busy these days, right? So, oh, yeah. I guess <laughs> I guess we have the same challenge as anyone selling to to a sales director or a, an operations director. So, I don't think our challenges of getting hold of people are unique there. Um, we, uh, their budgets, I guess, um, uh, I'm not going to say showcase is cheap, but I think showcase is in line with the type of budget they would have yeah. for, um, internal communication. So we don't find, I guess we don't find that we get a lot of pushback on the budget and I don't have budget for that is not, is not a huge objection for us. We might have to wait till the next financial year, but, um, yeah, so we don't get a, we don't have a big struggle there. And what was the other? There was a third question in there. Um, yeah, the budget part, and is there a particular title in marketing that typically manages these type of things? Yeah, um, for us, it's a VP or director of marketing. Okay. Yeah, and um, yeah, a VP or director. And are you able to sell over the phone, or does it require a face to face? It definitely requires a face to face. Um, for I mean, there is a certain portion that we can sell over the phone and over email and video conference, and that would typically be a customer with less than about a hundred users. But anybody with more than a hundred users, we would expect to go to a face to face sales com- sales meeting, and that is that is to bring the product to life. I mean, so many of us with technology products. They sort of vaguely sound good in words and, and in writing, but it's really until you see them in action and see them come to life that they make sense and and then you can really see the value in front of you. So we do go to a lot of face to face sales meetings and those are generally our most successful our most that is generally our most successful way of way of selling. And I, I bet those meetings go good because you've got a very visual product. Uh, it's a new, it's, um, people can connect with it pretty easily. After that meeting, how many of the deals get stuck versus go to closure? Because you're selling to a company, they have to fill out a purchase request, they've got to get approval. Uh, do they own that budget? Do they have authorization? Is there a long time gap? 
So a typical a typical deal cycle for us is 120 days from the the date of the first meeting, whether that's uh, over the phone or in person. Yeah. So most of that is, as you mentioned, the logistics we sell because we're selling to larger enterprises, it's the logistics of getting a purchase order, having the budget approved, um, onboarding us as a supplier, um, and in many cases, going through a a long-winded procurement process. (laughs) So (laughs) I won't go, that's another topic for another day. Um, So yeah, it's it's more getting through those technical hurdles. Um, Of course, you know, I wish I could say that Every meeting we go to, it's an immediate yes, and then it's just a case of 120 days. Sometimes it is about, um, you know, if for very sales-led organi- cus- our customers of ours who are very much sales-led, an example would be Mitsubishi Motors or Samsung, they will want to involve their VP of sales or somebody senior in the sales team as well. So they are not going to typically just buy this um, approve it as a marketing media. tool and ship it out. Yeah, they're going to want their sales team or somebody senior in the sales team to buy into the concept as well. So that is um, that is typically something that we would go back and forth on uh, over that time as well. And is there kind of this evaluation or proof of concept stage? Yeah, and we're so lucky in this. So for many vendors, it's not really practical to set up a demonstration environment or it's not easy. But for us, we're, we have this great, we have this, this is a great part of our process that if we can get uh, a potential customer to send us a bunch of resources, you know, send us a few dozen sales resources and we can put together a demonstration of showcase and have it in their hands just a few days later if, if there's room in the studio. Yeah. And that, that, um, yeah, gosh, it's such a common part of our sales process. I have, I, I sort of overlook it. But um, once once customers or potential customers see their own brand in action and their own materials, um, you know, their eyes you know, their eyes light up, and that does help really help smooth the sales process. Yeah, it's kind of that test drive or that transfer of ownership takes place where they can kind of see themselves using the product when they see their mm-hmm. content inside it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. How long did it take before that light bulb went off within your company to do that? Or was it immediate or? Yeah, it's actually something that because I had, because I'd had access to graphic designers through my old company um, and one of the co-founders still owned an advertising agency, we just had immediate access to designers. And actually, I think... I wish it could say it was like that we'd cleverly figured that out as a part of the sales <laughs> process. But I think it was more that, um, you know, in the early days, the product had uh, definitely some weak points and it was better for us to build a demonstration and give that demonstration to the customer than give them a trial account and let them find all those flaws for themselves. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it started more, as, I guess, as a necessity than a very cleverly positioned part of our sales process. Because I always found, you know, because in the complex sale like yours, after that presentation, that that face to face meeting, you got to kind of find a way of staying engaged. Yes, very much so. And the demonstrations do do that. Yeah. Um, the back and forth of requesting the materials is a great way to stay in touch. Um, yeah, the, and showcase itself has a very rich analytics engine in the background, and those analytics is definitely a major selling point for our customer because they can see which of the ma- which of the materials that they've sent out are being used who's using them what they're sharing all of this sort of insight is available for our buyer but at the same time when we set up a demonstration we have that same insight into how often the demonstration is being used so um yeah we can reach out based on the level of activity we're seeing there or not seeing in the demonstration and what else did you do to keep that momentum going? Because you got 128 days, so that's what four months. That's a long time. You probably got a bunch of these going on, and and I bet you always leave feeling that it went great and it's going to happen. Yet, you know, some of them they just stall or slow down or just lose the excitement. Yeah, and I I think over the six years that I've been selling or seven years that I've, um, 
I've learned to temper my enthusiasm. <laughs> of course, I did I used to leave every meeting thinking it was a sure thing. Yeah. Um, and that is partly, you know, people you're meeting with don't like to let you down, especially when they know it's your own product and you've come with all this passion and enthusiasm for it. But um, I think over the years, myself and my team have learned to recognize um, that there's going to be that initial burst of enthusiasm, but there is a long and slower slog to get that from the initial enthusiasm through to a closed deal with a purchase order and an invoice having been generated. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I don't have a particular piece of wisdom to share here. It's more been learning over time. Um, some of the things that we can look for to to feel very confident it's got a chance of getting to the next stage is how quickly the person would supply us with materials for a demonstration. Yeah. If that happens inside of the first week, that's a really good sign. Um, think those are sort of the starts of the things where we can start to see that it's going to be easier to keep it going. Um, and then there's all of the more obvious signs I think that most of us in sales are familiar with, like being ghosted or just not hearing back at all. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah. And that's it. I, I have kind of this law called uh, if it's not overtly positive, it's covertly negative. Like, yeah, that like, is so true. Like the ghosting or, you know, when they do come back to you and they meet all their commitments or all their uh, promises, you, you get a sense that, yeah, you're, they are engaged. They are connecting to the product. Um, were you able to kind of spread out these give and takes over the, that first 30 days or so to get that, the technical sale where they really wanted the product and got it and connect it to it? Um, I think the way that we have managed, I mean, so the way that we have managed to spread it out is to getting that demonstration done. And then the next step for us is to try to prompt, uh, some additional users inside the organization. Yeah. So that's the next best thing for us to see is that there's, you know, a handful or a dozen other users inside the business having been added and that those people are also actively using the demonstration. Um, I guess, I guess those are the two, key, the two key points for us is the demo and the addition of users. Um, and then hoping that there starts to be a, a back and forth of question and answer of, can I? Can the customer get into those analytics to have a look? Um, typically, we'll start to get questions about security, um, which means that somebody, cares somebody in the IT that. team, cares about that. <laughs> yep, and wants to know before it's signed off. Um, yeah, and then the magic question about can we connect the billing teams? Okay. How about as far <laughs> as justifying the cost? Was that easy to do? Was there, you know, I, I guess the analytics and the contrast between solving the problem another way? Yeah, for a lot of the, the big ticket item for a lot of our customers is the trade off for what they're currently printing. So they can look at their print budget and immediately check off a bunch of things that they're not going to have to print anymore. Um, it used to be a little bit balanced out by the organization having to buy devices, but Typically now the devices already exist in the company. So they are checking off how much they're immediately going to save in print. Uh, for a lot of our buyers, they can immediately check off. This sounds like a small thing, but for the buyer, it's typically quite a person, personally quite a big thing or a big thing for the marketing team. So they can check off the, the emails 600 times a day that ask for, can you send me this? Can you send me the latest version of the customer presentation? Or can you send me the new, the latest version of the uh, specifications document? Yeah. Right. So the sell, both the sales and the marketing team um, eliminate a big headache there. So um, that's less of a financial thing that they can check off, but definitely an emotional thing that appeals to both the sales and the marketing leaders. Um, yeah. So I think those are the ways that the typical ways that our customers will justify the cost. Um, we do have a lot of customers who have got a, a green focus. So they are seeing it, seeing the environmental impact of not printing or you know, not printing and dispatching hard copies. Um, and the and reputation, I get there's the reputational thing as well. This is going to make us look a lot more professional in the field. And I think also on their responsibility, like if there's a spelling error or a typo, 
you know, right. that goes to the printer. That's annoying, expensive, time consuming that digitally. And it, yeah, it just takes a I'm second. I'm sorry. Um, and, um, and for some of our clients, such as clients in medical de- in the medical device space, there's like a true legal cost to an error being in the market. So, that's true. Um, yeah. yeah, that's another one for them. Excellent. How about, did, did you have a particular lockout that would kind of uh, block out the competitives or alternative solutions? Um, I'm not familiar with that phrase, a lockout, but... Uh, uh, like one thing, either um, a feature or a capability that you had that nobody else had. Right. Yeah. In the early days, uh, we were the first of our direct competitive set. We were the first to cover all of the operating systems. So you could create, we call the product that you make inside of Showcase is also called a showcase. So you create a showcase or a collection of resources. Once you hit publish, that can go out to any Android, iOS or Windows device and um, or a Chrome device. And um, we were the first in our direct competitive set to do that. Um, and then, but now it's really more about our analytics. Everybody, all of our direct competitors have those as well, but we have some very specific analytics. One of them is called timeline. And if I'm the marketing manager, I can go in and I can see that, um, that Brian looked at the customer case study for two minutes and then he presented, he showed the customer the customer presentation for three minutes and he looked at a video for a minute so I can see exactly what you looked at and in exactly what order and as the marketing manager that material is obviously really important to me to see what is making sales, um, what isn't making sales, what's never being used, all of that rich insight. Um, We think ours is is better than our competitors. (laughs) Have you thought of doing any kind of AI on top of that of, you know, looking for patterns it's it's in the roadmap yeah, yes okay. <laughs> and do you as the company have that data as well or is just the customer um we as the company have it as a global as global information so yeah. across all the customers and it's anonymized but um we don't legally i guess legally we don't have we couldn't reuse that on a per customer basis or ethically ethically really either uh, but you could do it from a research standpoint, like, uh, okay, I can, well, I guess not. But if you could correlate it back to uh, the CRM where, you know, sales cycle, how long the presentation, what slides seem to resonate the most, to spend the most time on. Uh, and, you know, you could, so you could see when an opportunity started and it closed. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, <laughs> A lot of uh, a lot of our customers actually, lar- the larger enterprises, they can export our analytic data as CSV, and they will put it into a B, a business intelligence tool, um, and they will do that kind of thing for themselves. But um, we would like to develop something so that we can save them that hassle, and so that for smaller companies or medium sized companies that don't have a BI tool, that they can come in and get some of that um, for themselves as well. So that's that's sort of what what is on the future roadmap. Okay. Uh, one last yeah. question. As as a salesperson, what do you see as your superpower that really that <laughs> something you develop? The, the one thing if it, that you think differentiates you? Um, honestly, in this market, I have to say that it is my accent. Uh, I used to be <laughs> I used to be incredibly self conscious about it, and um, I would always apologize for it, and I was always really shy about it. But a friend of mine said to me once. Um, I hope this isn't speaking out of turn, but she said to me once, when Americans hear accents, if they if they rank their favorite accents, Australian is at the top and no one can tell the difference between your accent and an Australian accent, so make it your superpower. <laughs> <laughs> so in this market, that would be my superpower. But more honestly, um, I'm not going to say work hard. I'm going to say that um, it has been to work to my strengths. I used, again, like the accent, I used to really think I've got to fix all of my weaknesses and concentrate on those. But when I decided instead to improve my strengths, I think that's um, really the thing that helped me the most in sales. That's good. It's the first time I've heard accent. I've heard <laughs> curiosity, listening, empathy. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> and stay hydrated. There's the other one, right? Yeah, but, but I think it's interesting <laughs> that uh, you viewed it as a negative when it, it turns out to be a, a super positive. Yeah, I've learned to work with it. <laughs> Excellent, Millie. I appreciate your time today. Where can people go to connect with you and learn more about your company? Uh, so in this particular instance, people can come to, uh, let me see, just grab the specific URL I should have had in front of me, showcaseworkshop.com forward slash B2B revenue. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a landing page there so they can have um, access to a trial, access to some customer examples. Um, and that's, the best, that's the best place to start. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that. Hey, make sure you check us out on LinkedIn. And B2B Revenue is the website. You get the free ebook there. You can learn about the courses. Uh, you can also check out my YouTube channel, Brian Burns Sales Podcast on YouTube, where I store both these podcasts, my videos that I do daily on sales and marketing tips, all the webinars are hosted there. So if you ever get lost and you don't know where to go, Brian Burns sales podcast on YouTube is a great place to be. And you can sign up to get uh, on my calendar at B2B Revenue under training. And we can talk over your sales and marketing situations about getting you into your dream accounts in a fast, natural, organic way. And if you happen to see my content fly by on LinkedIn, I'd really appreciate a like or comment or a share, and we'll see you next time.